I will, I will. Where else can I yes, go? I will trust you, Lord. Who else can I turn to? Every believer join in the same. I will, I will trust you. Trust. I will, I will trust you. Praise the most high God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everybody that's here in the name of Jesus. Peace to everybody tuning in on the internet, as well as on the uh, phone line. As we get into another Sabbath day lesson, I usually mention last night's lesson. I'm going to mention uh, really last week's lesson, did a lesson titled, This Life is a Test That You Must Pass. So, and if you look around, that's exactly what's going on for many people that believe and serve the true and living God. We're being tested and we're being tried. So, I did that a couple of weeks. I did it actually in uh, L.A. again last week as well. And then last night we had a lesson, Faith in the Invisible God. And sometimes that comes hard. Because, again, we see what's in front of our face, but we don't see the Lord. But when you get some understanding of the Bible, that's the key to the whole thing. When you get some knowledge and understanding, some wisdom about the Lord from the scriptures, you know that no matter what happened, the Lord is in control. The Lord is sitting on the throne. And though you don't see him. So today, kind of continuing, we got a lesson. Uh, Sister Michelle wasn't uh, feeling good. She's actually in the hospital. Keep Sister Michelle in your prayers. She went to the hospital earlier. So I didn't get the lesson typed up, so we're going to do a little old school. I don't th They didn't get emailed or anything. So uh, this is how I grew up in the Word. I didn't have no handout. I had to make my own notes. I had books of notes. So that's what you need to do today. 
if you want to have the scriptures. We don't have many scriptures. We got 12 scriptures, 51 verses. And the title is Comfort One Another with These Words. Comfort one another with these words. And this go back to what we've been dealing with. We've been tested. And we got to have faith in the God that we don't see, but we know he's there. And that's one of the things that the Lord said that he, he would comfort us. He said he won't leave you comfortless. Even though he was leaving and you don't see him, but we still see him. Because we see them spiritually speaking. Comfort one another with these words. The one problem I say with that title, which is a direct quote from the Bible, come right out the Bible. Brother Mark read it in the opening scripture. And, it's, and obviously it's not a problem with the scripture. The one problem with people nowadays, they don't understand that scripture. Because as a matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians 4, the verses that come before the verse in question, people have made a whole nother doctrine out of it. They've told us that this is when the rapture come. This is, when the, this is the rapture here. But that showed me they don't understand because... Why, would he, why is he saying comfort one another? He's speaking about something that's going on where you need to be comforted. You wouldn't need to be comforted for the rapture. No, he's speaking about something going on in the believer's life at that time. So he made that statement, comfort one another with these words. And we're going to read those words, but we're going to read a lot more words to show you where you can be comforted. Like, I'm comforted today because of understanding the words that's in the Bible. I'm comforted today, even though dealing with hardship. And this is what people need to rely on. We need to rely on the word of God to be comforted by. The word of the invisible God. The invisible God that allow you to go through trials and tribulations. But in the end, he telling you all you got to do is overcome. That's why a man like Job can suffer more than any of us could imagine. And he get off the ground and say, praise the Lord anyway. So we're going to get into it. Comfort one another with these words. We're going to start off in, in the scripture. As the preacher would say, my text is from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. And we're going to copy them a little bit. We're just going to read that one verse. But the only problem is that would be all they would read the whole afternoon. But we're going to read a lot more. And then we're, we're going to come right back and understand why he's making this statement. Comfort one another with these words. What's going on that he make a statement like that? <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians 4, one verse, my brother. Go ahead. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so this is a direct quote. I didn't make it up. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So obviously we're not reading the words yet, but we're going to read them in a second. Put, put your bookmark here. We're going to come right back to it. Let's go to Isaiah 57. Because all of the words that you need to become, it's not just what Paul said, it's throughout the whole Bible because Paul wasn't saying anything new. The whole Bible is giving us the words that we need to understand and deal with brothers and sisters in any situation. The whole Bible is giving us the words of comfort in any situation, absolutely. Isaiah 57 and we're going to come right back to 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to read. But we're going to get the answer to what Paul is talking about in the Old Testament. Because none of this is new. Paul understood what he understood because he understood the Old Testament. Isaiah 57. And this is what we don't understand how the Lord do things. We're going to come back to 1 Thessalonians 4. Isaiah 57 and 1. Go ahead. The righteous perish, and no man layeth it to heart. Uh -huh. And merciful men are taken away. 
None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Okay, so he said the righteous perisheth. The righteous perish. And no man layeth at the heart. As a whole, people don't pay attention how the Lord been doing things all along. I said it before, in the beginning of time, because a lot of times you say, well, boy, man is so messed up now. Man is real. He is bad off now. We got killing all over the place. But we understand, when you know the Bible, this started a long time ago. In the beginning of time, it wasn't before people. Out of the first four people, we had the first murder. The first four people, Lord created Adam and Eve. They had Cain and Abel. You had enough people around. Now you got your murder. Already. Because man is bent on going against God. So going back there, we, we had somebody that suffered a loss. Of course, Adam and Eve suffered the loss of their son. But Abel, a righteous man, ended up perishing back then. But see, I understand what Solomon said. Solomon said, hey, I praise the dead more than the living. Then he said, better than them is him and hadn't been born and had to have to deal with this madness in this world. But he said, I praise the dead more than the living because, hey, the living still got to carry on and fight. Especially if the dead have done God's will, they got it made. So this is what he's talking about. He said, the righteous perisheth and no man layeth it to heart and merciful men are taken away. Go ahead. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his upright. So he said, merciful men are taken away, none considering. Most people don't pay this no attention. Sometimes we, we over sorrow for somebody that was good that was taken away. But that's natural, but that's for our own benefit because we going to miss them. We don't look at it from their standpoint. That, hey, the Lord saw them fit to remove them, not to have to deal with this no more. You say the righteous perish, no man led to the heart. Merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Hey, that, and we know in this world we got a lot more evil that's coming. Then it said, he shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds. He said, they're going to rest in their beds. See, we know people have lied to us and told us that when somebody died, when your loved one died, they done gone on to glory. They done gone on to be with the Lord. We know that's not the case. But we know still if they was righteous, they're going to be okay in the end. They're going to rest in the meantime. They're going to rest temporarily in their beds like he's saying. So these are some of the words that we can be comforted by when a righteous person is taken away. He said, the righteous perish, no man led to the heart, merciful men are taken away, and none consider that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall rest in their beds. In their bed, he shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their bed, each one walking in his uprightness. Because if you've been upright, nothing going to change that. Death can't even change that. That's what we striving for. But now let's go back to 1 Thessalonians because this is the thing. See, sometimes we don't understand what God is doing, but we know that he's in control. That's why we have to, like they were singing in the song, I told uh, Brother Jonah, maybe, maybe we'll sing it again at the end. But it's about trusting in the Lord. Sometimes even when you don't know what's going on, you still have to trust in the Lord. The Bible say the Lord will be our God even unto death. That means he's still in control. Back to 1 Thessalonians 4. And this time, we're going to read a little bit further. 
We're going to restart at 13 and read down to verse 18 and understand clearly what Paul was saying, but we already got the message from Isaiah. He's talking about someone that have lost a loved one that has died. And you don't even have to, even though you're going to be sorry because you lost them and you're going to grieve for them, you don't have to lose hope because really it's just, it's just your personal feeling. They okay. The Lord just told you they okay. He said somebody righteous, hey, I do this. I take them away from the evil to come. So you don't even have to worry about that. But it's for, it's, you know, it's natural. It's for our own, we would say, selfish means because, hey, when we love somebody, hey, we don't never want to see them go. But obviously somebody going to go. All the great prophets in the Bible, like I was talking about Brother Wayne last night, how sick he was. All the great prophets in the Bible eventually got to a point they got sick and they died. All of them. All the apostles eventually got to the point they died. So we know that that's just a matter of time. We understand that. We're fortunate enough to live in the last days where it's a possibility some of us going to live till the Lord come. But that obviously is not no guarantee. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. So this is what Paul was addressing. So this is why. But see, the, the key to it is he gave you the words to be comforted by. A lot of times in our modern churches, they want to be comforted. They comfort themselves in some lies. You don't want to be comforted in a lie. You don't want to give yourself a false sense of security. They say they love one is in heaven. But we know better than that. And he told you clearly what to be comforted. What words to be comforted by. Just like we read in Isaiah 57 that they're going to enter into peace. They're going to rest in their beds. And that's what all the dead, including the righteous dead, do until the Lord come back and wake them up. See, and that's again, that's having faith in the invisible God. But we know it's true. I don't even, I don't even just have faith. I know it's true. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. Go ahead, my brother. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. See, now this is what he's talking about. It's amazing that people come here and have made a rapture out of this, brothers and sisters. It is amazing that they have twisted this up and they miss the words that they need to be comforted by when they lose a loved one. When somebody fall asleep because they didn't turn it into a whole nother thing that's not even here. If you pay attention, this is the rapture scripture that they use. Rapture not in the Bible, but they come here and get caught up. That's all they want. But they missed the whole point of the verses here. But if you pay attention to the verses, we already know he's telling us he's trying to comfort some people with some words. If you pay attention to the verses, every verse from 13 on down, it's talking about somebody that has died. It's talking about somebody that's asleep, what we just read in Isaiah. They're going to end in the peace. They're going to sleep in their beds. So verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He don't want you to be ignorant. Concerning what? Them which are asleep. Them that have died, brothers and sisters. Simple as that. And, and see, I know why the Lord referred to it as sleep, because God, it ain't nothing for God. He's going to wake you up. That's what he had to tell Martha about Lazarus, her brother. She didn't understand he was going to do a thing then. That shows you people in the Bible understood the overall plan, though. But that's why he called it sleep. He's going to wake you up. Jesus talked to Martha. And she, she, they was all upset because Jesus hadn't got there. They was, you know, not mad or nothing, but they just say, look, if you would have been here, he probably wouldn't have died. Jesus, he's going to rise again. And she said, well, I know he's going to rise again at the last day in the rest. See, they knew. Right. <laughs> she said, point blank. I, said, I know that. Like, tell me something I don't know. He said, yeah, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. He's going to rise now. He said, I am the resurrection and life. So, but he always referred to it as just sleep because it ain't nothing for him to wake you up. 
I learned about death real young. Had a great uncle died. I was about five or six. And you know, you have, you have some old people in your family when you're young. You don't never hardly see them. You be in the house with them. You don't never hardly see them. He's at my grandmother's house, always in the back room. Then hadn't hardly ever come out. If I saw him, it was a gift. If I catch him back, there, I said, oh, he in the kitchen. <laughs> uncle, uh, uncle got V. So, but uh, that's my really first experience with death, about four or five. But I used to always tell my grandmother to wake him up. That was her uncle. I tell him to wake him up, wake, wake him up, wake him up, you know, in the house. Because he was seeing like he was always sleeping in that room. But finally, we was at the funeral, and I was telling her, wake him up, wake him up. She said, no, the Lord going to have to do that one. But it's just, it is just sleep. So that's why he referred to it as such. Paul said, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. See, he know you're going to go through some sorrowing. He know you're going to have some grief. That's only natural. But you don't have to lose it, lose your mind over it like some people would do. You see all kind of stuff going on among people when they lose somebody. So he said that you sorrow not about somebody to sleep as other people who don't have no hope because we still got some hope when we lose a loved one that's following the Lord. Like he said, righteous is taken away. Verse 14. But we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Oh, this is where your hopes need to lie. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, what? Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Even so them which sleep in Jesus. But again, verse 14, mentioning dead folks. Sleep. He just called it sleep when he talking about somebody died. Like, Jesus had to make it plain. He was trying to use that with his disciples. He kept telling them, look, before he got to Lazarus, he kept telling them Lazarus was asleep. Lazarus, they said, wherever he sleep, that's cool. He said, yeah, we're going to wake him. He said, where if he sleep, just let him sleep. They thinking he just talking about He said, look, Lazarus dead, <laughs> and I'm going to wake him up. And they were like, oh, okay. They was even marveled that he was going to Jerusalem because the people was trying to kill him in Jerusalem. They, they were scared to even go. They said, well, we might as well go with them. We can die with them because them people want to kill them. That show you Jesus was hated. That's another lesson. Right. But he, he was just saying sleep. So verse 14 said, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which we do. We know that. Even so, them also would sleep in Jesus. Somebody that died in the Lord. They was doing his will. Will God bring with him? He's going to bring him with him. So that's why he's telling you don't even have to worry in the big scheme of things. You're going to sorrow for yourself for losing him. Go ahead, 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, mm -hmm. that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. See, again. We ain't seen a rapture yet. You ain't going to see no rapture. This is not about a rapture here. This is about somebody that have died, that sleep in the Lord, and he's trying. He's giving them some words whereby they can comfort each other with. That's what he's doing, and we didn't miss the whole boat on this. So, again, verse 13, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, dead folks, 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then which sleep in Jesus will God bring dead folks. 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, that's us that's living right now. At that time, it was Paul and his generation. We which are alive and remain unto the coming. See, they didn't know if it was going to happen in their time, but it didn't, obviously. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Dead folks. Every verse talking about somebody that died, about dead folk. Obviously, the Thessalonians had lost somebody, and he's telling them, look, Lord got this covered. He got this base covered. So, and what he let them know in verse 15, even if just because you live in now and you live to the Lord come, you're not going to beat the dead people out. That's why he said you're not going to prevent them which are asleep. In other words, you better worry about you making it okay. 
because they're going to be ahead of the game on you as it stands right now. They are a step ahead of you. That's why he said, you're not going to be better than them. You're not going to be, you're not, that's what he means. You're not going to prevent them what y'all sleep. He's going to tell you verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now this is where it all come down when the Lord come back. This is where they get the rapture at, but it has nothing to do with a secret rapture to get people away from tribulation. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. He got the voice of the archangel. What else? And with the trump of God. And what else? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the dead in Christ. He just said the plane. He didn't even use sleep. Just in case you slipped up and missed it. The dead in Christ. Those that sleep. He's been talking about every verse. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Now he just said point blank dead. They going to rise first. That's why he said you're not going to prevent them. They're going to beat you. They're going to rise even before the saints get changed that's living. See, so it has nothing to do with a rapture. Because the rapture, you notice when people talk about the rapture, they don't never mention nobody dead, do they? Mm -hmm. They don't even never talk about nobody dead. But they come here to get it, and this is talking about somebody that have died. That's what this is talking about. They come in, the living people in verse 16, they only come in in where well, verse 17. They only come in in conjunction with the dead. That's right. The conversation is about those that have died. For the Lord himself. See, they act like the Lord not going to come all the way. Why does it say he going to descend from heaven? He coming all the way. We're going to meet him part way, but he coming all the way. With the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. That's the key. Shall rise first. Then we get to the rapture verse, which really, they didn't misuse this terribly when you understand it. 17. Then we put your alive finally, and remain. Finally, he get to somebody living. But the whole conversation is about, look, don't sorrow for your dead loved one. They're going to be okay. The Lord, if, don't be ignorant about them sleep. The Lord going to bring them back when he come. And he's showing you how he's going to bring them back. Don't mean they in heaven. See, we didn't been lied to at funerals thinking we supposed to be in heaven with the Lord, right? Right. When we die. Well, this debunked that right here, don't it? Because we see the people that have died in Christ haven't went to heaven to be with the Lord. They sleep until he come, brothers and sisters. Just like Isaiah said, they're going to rest in their beds. The righteous taken away from the evil to come. They're going to end in the peace. They're going to rest in their beds and they're going to come back at this time. Exactly at this time. The Lord himself should descend here with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive, those that's living, and remain. Some of us can be alive. Some of us might be among those that are sleeping, rising. We just want to be there. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Shall be caught up together with them who? In the clouds. About the, what the conversation is about, brothers and sisters, those that sleep. See, it ain't even about the living. He just bring in the living in connection with the dead. Then, finally, we which are alive. See, they get a rapture out of this, out of the word, caught up, and they made a whole doctrine out of this and missed the boat on what he's really talking about. He's trying to give you some comfort when you lose somebody. Like we didn't lost our brother Wayne. He's trying to comfort you on that note. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to do what? To meet the Lord in the air. Uh -huh. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Lord going to be here. He coming on this earth to rule. We just You meeting him in the clouds. Then he say what the title of the lesson is, and this is what we are comforted by at a time like this. What? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, but we know the words. We ain't got to make up no words. That's why when I do funerals or eulogies, I don't stand up there and make up no whole lot of lies. Say, well, the people, they not here. They gone to be with the Lord. Now, that would, that's a lie. It might make somebody feel better temporarily, but they believe in a lie. 
What the Lord got is good enough to comfort you with. Because remember one thing, sin, death was instituted because of sin. It's punishment for sin. So it got to be some kind of grief involved. It wasn't meant to be a pretty home going like they lied to us. That's why he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. With what words? That yo, when you lose somebody that's righteous, they okay. They're going to sleep until the Lord bring them back at the resurrection. They are straight. This is what he's saying. Let's go a little further. Go to, uh, back to Isaiah, the 26th chapter. We're going to read uh, Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. 26 and 19 through 21. Go ahead and read it when you get there. Thou dead man shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. You see what he said? Now you dead, but he said, thy dead man shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Who is this talking? Look, the Lord had to die. That's why I said <clears throat> to them that are sleeping Jesus. They died in the Lord. And the only reason we able to raise is because the Lord did it. That's why he started. Didn't he start that conversation off in 1 Thessalonians 4? He said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them that sleep. Then he said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. See, this was foretold already. Is this who it is? He said, thy dead man shall live. How are you going to be dead and live unless it's a resurrection? Don't have nothing to do with you not dying. No, it has something to do with you dying and being resurrected. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. See, somebody had to die already. Go ahead. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. Hey, that you talking about a happy day and, and, and time to sing a song. Because as soon as we was born, we start headed toward death. This body wasn't meant to last forever. And some young people might not quite understand it, but live a little longer. You going to see. He said, thy dead men shall live to, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. Go ahead. For they... But thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, uh -huh. and the earth shall cast out the dead. Thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Because they got to come back. And, and the righteous coming back pronto when the Lord comes. That's the timetable. The Lord, he don't. He give you all the ingredients to understand. Like he tells you exactly what's going to happen. The trumpet going to be sounding and all that. That's why it's amazing. We made up a rapture out of 1 Thessalonians, and then we turned around and lied and said people just die and go to heaven. Just one lie after another. You can't substantiate it. Verse 20, go ahead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shout thy doors, and shut thy doors about thee. Mm -hmm. Hide thyself as if as it were for a little moment uh -huh. until the indignation be over, overpassed. See, that's why he said you don't even have to fear death, brother and sister. Matter of fact, death is, like we read in Isaiah, death be a relief for the righteous at times. Death be a relief. Even Paul talked about, he said, hey, to die would be gang for me. But I got to live and keep doing what I need to do in the meantime. That's what Paul said a number of times. That's what he was letting you know. The righteous is taken away from the evil to come. So he's saying it here. He said, come, my people, enter into thy chamber. That's the grave. He's talking about the grave. Shut thy doors about thee. You know, you being enclosed in. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment. And that's all it is, brothers and sisters, is a little moment. See, the people take a verse out of context and don't get the understanding. They mess up 2 Thessalonians. We read 2 Thessalonians 5 last night because we was dealing with, uh, you know, faith in the invisible God where it says we walk by faith and not by sight. But they go there and also, and they really mess that up 
uh, saying, oh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And they take that to mean, they take it out of context. They take that to mean that when you die, you immediately going to be present with the Lord. So, you know, I did a funeral in Philadelphia, and that's what the brother, I, I laid all these scriptures out saying the brother's dead. He won't be back to the resurrection. You know, God was upset at the end. He tried to, he tried to pull a mutiny. You know, they was doing something, you know, preparing for the thing or looking at the body or whatever, final viewing, and he started just singing in his seat. Oh, all I know is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Quoting that, yeah, I know what you're trying to say, but you don't understand it. So, but he, and he got loud with it because it was a little inter, interim where they was looking at the body. But after it was over, when it, when it come time for the, uh, what you call, they call it benediction or really the, uh, uh, where you do the, uh, the uh, I forgot even what you call it, but I do it at the end of the funeral where you say you commit them, the committal. You commit them to the dust because that's where they're going. Hey, I made it clear. Yeah, you don't understand that. But right now, he going back to the dust. That's what happened right now because that's what the Lord said, dust thou and dust shall thou return. You going to call the Lord a lot? The Lord said that. But then that's not... Nothing for us to get bent out of shape because he's going to wake you up out of the dust. That's the good news. He's going to wake you out of the dust. And, the, and better than that, you coming back with a brand new body. You couldn't ask for nothing else. Why not be comforted by the truth, brothers and sisters, instead of a lie? That's what comforted me, knowing the truth. So that's what he mean when he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord yeah, that's your next step. And how much time do you think is going to elapse when a person die and they present with the Lord? It could have been a thousand years. How much time are they experiencing? None. Because they're going to close their eyes one second. They're not going to know nothing else until the next moment they wake up. So that's why he could say that. But it could have been a thousand years. So that they don't, it, it's not telling you they immediately going to be with the Lord. All you got to do is stick with the content. So that's why he said here at verse 20, come my people in into thy chamber, shut the doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for what? A little moment. That's all it is. That's all it is because you sleep. We have read repeatedly you sleep. It really is sleep. You don't know nothing. The Bible said when you take your last breath, your thoughts perish. Sometimes your thoughts perish before then if you done suffered some problems with the brain. But when you take your last breath, that is it until the Lord wake you up. It's just a moment. And then he said, until the indignation be overpassed. Notice it always focuses that because that's what people don't understand. That's what Jesus is bringing when he come. He bringing wrath. He bringing some murder, death, kill when he comes because the world is totally wicked. That's why he say, until the indignation be overpassed. That's why he said earlier, the righteous is taken away from the what to come? The evil to come. It's some evil coming. That if we all had the chance, we probably should all prefer to be sleep. The prophet Job going to tell you that in a second. But go ahead, read verse 21. He going to tell you. He going to bring it to you. Go ahead. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Okay, so now what he said? He said, the, this is how it's going to happen. We know when the Lord comes, that's when the dead being raised too. So that's what he's leading up to. Then he said, you're going to be hiding in the grave until, for a moment until the indignation be passed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place not to rapture nobody. He's going to raise the dead. They're going to meet him in the clouds so they can be with him. That's right. That's, that's when everybody getting their reward that was righteous. The Lord is coming out of his place to punish 
the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Because the Lord is opening up the graves at this time. Now, let's go to Job 14. Job 14. And we're going to pick it up at one. Job knew perfectly. You talking about a man that had to deal with, like I said, a title a couple of weeks ago and last week in L.A., was this life is a test. You talking about a man had to deal with a test. You don't, hey, you don't see nobody with no greater test than Job. You talking about being hit. You talking about the ceiling falling in. Hey, he had it. But he understood that none of it didn't mean nothing. This thing is about salvation. This is what we trying to overcome. And death can't stop that. Job 14 and 1. Go ahead. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. See, that's why a lot of times, hey, death be a relief. Because man that is born of woman is the way it is today. It's few days and full of trouble. Since Adam sinned, that's the way it is, brothers and sisters. It wasn't meant to be pretty after we sinned. You got to pay now. Go ahead. He cometh forth like a flower. Oh, beautiful occasion when a baby born, right? This looks like a flower. Everybody happy, people singing, passing out cigars, all kind of stuff. It's a beautiful occasion. But we know as sure as babies are born, death comes too, don't it? Because the Bible says it's a time to be born, it's a time to die. So he coming forth so he don't leave you in the dark. He tells you the whole story. He coming forth as a flower. Then what happened shortly and it, thereafter? And it's cut down. And it's cut down. Go ahead. He fleeth also a shadow and continueth not. He said he fleeth as a shadow and continue not. That's how life and death is that quick. Skip over to verse 12 and go ahead. So man lieth down and raiseth not. So man, this, this is talking about death. Man lies down and rises not. We cannot put somebody in heaven immediately if man lies down and rises not. See, we want to believe in, we want to be comforted with some false words. That give us a false sense of security. And people don't fear God as they should. Because God said, if you sin, I'm going to kill you. And God ain't going to lie. So he bring death. And now the key is to avoid the second death, which is a lake of fire. So you got to be righteous from here on out. You got to accept what Jesus did, his sin offering, and be righteous from here on out to avoid the second death. And if you don't do that, he going to wake you up and give you that. But you know he's not playing by what he did with the first death. But when Satan watered down like he told Eve, that's what he got to eat a sin with. Eve said, look, we know nah, we can't eat of that one tree. Satan said, oh, girl, come on, please. You believe that? Come on, baby. You know, he just, God wouldn't do that. What kind of God would kill? See, God just don't want you to be like him. You ain't going to really die. I mean, that's what should have got to tell you. But you mean I ain't going to surely die? If I'm going to die a little bit, what's going to happen? Oh, but he smoothed it past her and she went headlong for it and we've been dying. Now we let preachers tell the same lie. They're not really dead. You look at the person in the casket. They're not really dead. You got a phone call saying so-and-so died. They're not really dead. Look, I want to talk. Whoever called me lied. But he said, so man lies down and rises not till when? Till the heavens be no more. Till the heavens be no more. The heavens would have been to roll back when man come out the grave. Because Jesus would have been the king. We gonna, the dead we saw clearly going to meet the Lord in there. That's why we don't have to sorrow out of hand. But he's going to sleep until the heavens be no more. But it ain't going to be no time lapse for them. Go ahead. They shall not wait, awake nor be raised out of their sleep. They not going to wake nor be raised out of their sleep. Not at all. Until that time, Job understood it, 13. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, mm -hmm. that thou wouldest keep me secret until thou wrath be paid. Job didn't say, oh, just bring me up to glory. 
bring me up to glory where you bring everybody up. Now, Job knew what it was. He didn't ask for nothing out the way. He said, Lord, I, be, I, I know how you're going to do it, and I'll be satisfied. Just hide me in the grave. Matter of fact, wake me up when all the mess over. This is really what Job's saying. He said, let me sleep through the all it because I know there's some drama coming. Hmm. I know it's some wrath coming. Remember, the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. So Job said it. He said, hide me in the grave. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that you wouldest keep me secret until your wrath be passed. He bring it. Job knew the Lord was bringing wrath. How many preachers telling us that's how this thing going to end in wrath? Jesus bringing wrath. When we saw the saints meet Jesus in the, in the air, that's the beginning of the wrath coming down. He going to have the saints with him so they can execute it with him. Hide me in the grave. Keep me secret until thy wrath be passed. That what? That thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember he me. He said, just remember me at the set time. Job knew what it was going to be. Go ahead. If a man die, shall he live again? That's oh. the question. Not that you won't die. If a man die, shall he live again? Job knew the answer. It's rhetorical. What's the answer? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. He come. knew it was going to be many days. That he was going to have to wait. Though he won't be counting the days, he knew what it was like. He knew it was at the end. Like he said in uh, Job 27, he said, I know my redeemer going to stand at the earth in the latter day. See, he knew it was some time off. So he knew he was going to sleep in the grave until then. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. We all need a change, brothers and sisters. This body wasn't going to make it. Hmm. It wasn't meant to make it once man sinned. It probably wasn't never meant to make it. The Lord showed you how it was going to come. This body was going to have to get changed into that glorious body. Enoch did it. That's right. Enoch, I pointed out last night, he never died. He went from flesh to spirit in an instant. That's why, that's why the, the Bible could say there's nothing new under the sun. Because some people will be living when Jesus comes, when he brings the dead back. They're going to come back first. And then he said, we which are alive and remain shall be called together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. Those people are going to be changed when they meet the Lord in the air. But that won't be the first time somebody got changed because Enoch got translated. He did not die. Got brother saying, well, Enoch, he had to die. You know, everybody died. It said these all died. Yeah, it, it gave you Enoch as an exception. Lord, do what he want to. Jesus told the woman, he said, look, he said, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But the woman humbled herself so great, you know, she said, well, Lord, I just, you know, uh, uh, help me. I need help. My daughter got this devil. Jesus said, yeah, but it ain't good for me to take the children's bread to cast it to the dog. Jesus, the woman said, yeah, I understand, Lord, but, you know, the dog, get them crumbs that fall from that master table. Jesus said, he said, you too much. You got too much. For I'm, I'm going to do this for you. <laughs> he said, you got it. Sure, the Lord do what he want to do. He got his, he got the order of things, but in life, and so it is with the Lord, there always can be an exception to the rule. Enoch was just an exception to the rule. That's all. But we all need that change. So Job said, thou shalt call. He knew he was going to sleep in the grave until the Lord called him. And he said, I'm going to answer thee. Go ahead. Thou will have a desire. You finished that 15? If um, No, we stopped okay. at the end of 14. Okay, finish. Read 14 15. and 15 on through. Go okay. ahead. Okay. If a man die, shall he live again? Good question. Go ahead. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. And that's the answer. The change. He got to wait for it, though. That's what we don't want to do. We don't want to wait. We want it now. We want to say, no, nah, they ain't die. Look, if we hadn't sinned, we wouldn't have to deal with this. But now we got to suffer the punishments that come with sin. The wages of sin is what the Bible say? Death. Why are we going to let a preacher tell us they ain't dead at a funeral then? And the Bible say all sin, right? You can't even just blame Adam. All sin. 15. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. He said, the Lord going to call me. And I'm going to answer, and it's not going to be just him, because it's a set time for all the righteous. Go ahead. Thou will have a desire to the work of thine hand. Daniel 12. Daniel 12. Daniel 12. See, but this is what comforted 
Com it's supposed to comfort us when we lose someone, family member, spiritual brothers and sisters, because we know what the end result is. Daniel 12 and 1. Go ahead. And at that time shall Michael stand up. The great priest which standeth for the children of thy people. Uh -huh. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. See, it always concludes with great trouble. Great trouble. Again, starting off, it said, the righteous are delivered from the evil to come. Merciful men are taken away. Nobody played late at the heart. That's how the Lord been doing things. So he said, Michael, which is the archangel, he's going to stand up the great prince who's standing for the children of our people. There should be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. This is at the end, great tribulation. Only one time like that. And that's when the Lord is going to start. That's the time when the Lord is going to be delivering us. Even from the dead. Verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Oh, many of them that sleep. Notice they still going to be sleep until the end. We already know that. Paul made that clear. But don't nobody know that because they didn't made something else out of that. They didn't made a secret rapture out of that. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. Shall awake some to what? Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. See, even the wicked going to get awakened at, at the ultimate end. Only the righteous going to be awakened when Jesus comes. Later on, the wicked going to be awakened. And they're going to have to suffer judgment. And that's when the second death is going to come into play. John, the fifth chapter. But they going to be Everybody, including the righteous, got to sleep until the Lord do this. That's why he said many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. How many times do we got to read sleep to understand that that's what happened when you die? You go to sleep and you sleep until the Lord wake you up at the end. That's why Paul kept saying, don't, don't sorrow for those that are asleep. They're going to be all right. They're going to be back. Not that they... With the Lord now, no. The Lord going to bring him when he come back. He going to bring him back then. <clears throat> John 5. Let's let Jesus tell you. If you can't believe nobody, you got to believe Jesus. But Jesus, this whole Bible go together. That's how you know when you got it right. You can prove it all over. Same thing. How we believe in people don't die and they magically go to be with the Lord is amazing with all these scriptures. How we believe in a rapture is amazing. When you don't have nothing to substantiate that. 5 and 28. John 5 and 28. Go ahead. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. That means, brothers and sisters, until the hour will come, all that have died are where? In the grave. In the grave. That's just elementary. This is Bible 101. That's showing you how crafty Satan is. He take what God say and turn it absolutely around and have deceived people to believe it. He's not going to tell you what God's saying. He got you believing something else. And you're going to believe something else in the name of God. That's how you worship another God. That's how you do it. Jesus plain. He said, don't marvel at this. Because I'm going to tell you something big. For the hour is coming in the woods. That means the hour wasn't here yet. And the hour is not here yet. According to what we read in Thessalonians. But it's still coming. What hour is coming? In the woods all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. 29. And shall come forth. They that have done good. That's the key. Because everybody going to come forth. But it's just what side of the fence you going to come forth on. That's the key. Because everybody died. See, the point is we need to understand that righteous men die just like wicked men right now. Because of sin. Because man got it coming for disobedience. But the good news is, he said, 
they going all in the grave going to hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good is what you want to meditate on. Go ahead. Unto the resurrection of life. Unto the resurrection of life. And we saw that's going to take place immediately as Jesus is descending from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ going. See, that's only righteous right there that's meeting the Lord in the air. Only the good is meeting the Lord in the air. The wicked going to sleep on and get theirs at judgment day over a thousand years later. That's another lesson. But he said, they going to come forth. They that have done good until the resurrection of life. See, some preachers only want to tell you the good side of things, but it's good to know both sides of things. So you can know that, hey, there is an option that you don't want to take, but it's there. Go ahead. And they that have done evil until the resurrection of damnation. So everybody coming back. So nobody go nowhere when they die. They don't go to heaven or hell. You notice that funeral, they don't really put nobody in hell. Don't matter. You can know they was bad as they wanted to be. You can know they was no good. Preacher don't come up and say, I'm going to tell you John in hell. I'm just going to tell y'all. Bad as he was. I ain't going to sugarcoat. No, nah, they ain't say that. They say little nice little platitudes. You know, John was, he did it his way. <laughs> He told you it was on his mind. I mean, he cursed you out. But they don't say that because they too nice for that. But the truth of the matter is, yeah, nobody is going to go nowhere until they get resurrected anyway. Nobody going nowhere. They sleep. Everybody is asleep until the resurrection. People read lies was in the rich man. They said, well, it looked like, look, that was a parable pointing to the end, but it told you. That uh, the, the rich man had to went, he was buried. Then it just jumped to the end. Because they all got to come back according to what Jesus said. They going to all come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, that's Lazarus. See, that's something to take note about Lazarus. See, in this life, you still got to die. Even though Jesus raised Lazarus after being dead four days, he raised him into a mortal body, his same mortal body. He had to die again. That had to, that had to be something for him. He, had to, he dealt with that twice. Hmm. But he had to die again to be ready for the final, for the resurrection. So he will be on the good side. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil, they coming back in the resurrection of damnation. That's, where the, that's when the rich man going to get his. Nothing has happened right now. Let's go to... Uh, What's next on the list? Oh, no, nobody got it, huh? I, I, I got to keep up with my phone because my phone go dark. I don't see it. Acts 24. Acts 24. I don't know. I was thinking Mark had it for some reason. But Mark can help me out. He came here. He's like, dude, better hope your battery don't go out. Acts 24. See, because that's what we got hope in. And comforted by the words that's in the scripture. That's why we have to be able to read the scripture. Acts 24 and 14. Go ahead. By this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Okay, so now Paul, he actually was being questioned and being charged, and they was arresting him for saying he was a false prophet. He was dealing with hearsay, with false doctrine, because he was preaching Jesus. That's what they didn't understand. But he wasn't changing all the Old Testament up. He just understood where Jesus came out of the Old Testament, where Jesus fit into this. They didn't get it. So he had to explain that to them, because some people think, you know, Jesus started a new religion called Christianity, and we just throw away all the old. You know, that's what they come with. Well, we ain't got to do none of that Old Testament. We got Jesus now. Look, Paul had Jesus, and he still said, I believe and follow what the Old Testament said, because that's where Jesus come from. So he said, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy. See, they said Paul, is deal he's dealing with heresy. heresy. So he said, what they call heresy, I do. I worship the God of my fathers, like they saying, 
believe in all things which are written in the law and in the prophet. That means Paul still believed and didn't eat no swine. Nobody won't tell you. Ask some of these Catholic priests who, you, who most people don't know. That's where they ain't got their doctrine from. Go ask Paul. Go ask the Catholic priest, did Paul ever eat pork in his life? They would tell you no. You know why? Because he believed what was written in the law and the prophet. It's not like we heard that they thought it was done away with and started some new religion. He believed the Old Testament. Why is it that we let somebody tell us the Old Testament is no good now then? Paul believed Everything that's written in the Old Testament, in the law and the prophets. And what else did he believe? Verse 15. And have hope toward God, uh -huh. which they themselves also allow. He said, I got hope toward God, which they allow. Go ahead. That there shall be a resurrection of the dead, uh -huh. both of the just and unjust. There shall be a resurrection of the dead. Paul said, this is what I got hope in, which they allow. See, and this wasn't something new because though we just read what Jesus said it in John 5, right? Jesus said the hour was coming all in the grave is going to hear his voice and they're going to come forth. They have done good to the resurrection of life and they have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's this right here. That's this right here, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. So that's our New Testament, but we read it already in the Old Testament. What did we read in Daniel 12? He said, them that sleep in the dust, after that time of trouble, them that sleep in the dust going to come forth. Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. See, everybody going to live forever. It's just which side other fence you're going to live on. We want to be on the right side. That's why we know our brother Wayne was walking on the right side. That's why I'm comforted by his passing. But now, read 15 again. And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. See, this is what Paul had hope in. He didn't have some false hope in that you don't die, brothers and sisters, that you going to be with the Lord. See, they give you false hope at all these funerals we go to. That's why when we do funerals, people be sitting there, you don't hardly hear nothing. They be sitting there. Hmm. <laughs> some people get mad and walk out. We don't care. Some people be looking hard. I think it was near my uncle or somebody. Boy, they was looking. It's been a few of them, but they was looking like they were mad. And I just get mad too. I just, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what the Lord said. That's what the Lord told Ezekiel. He said, don't be afraid of their faces. They're going to have some hard faces. I'm going to make your face hard too. I got a hard forehead too. <laughs> but let's go a little further. Let me get my phone together. Go to uh, Philippians 3. We're almost done. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Philippians 3 and verse 1. We're going to read through a little bit. Go ahead. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, mm -hmm. but for you it is safe. See, this is what I point out a lot. Because we be here, once you've been here a little bit, you might know pretty much got the gist of what we teach, even though we teach a lot. That's why it takes some time. You can't come two, three weeks and know it. You got to come two, three years and know it. That's right. But once you've been here that long, you would know it. Now it's just keeping it rehearsed, keeping it in your mind. So you still don't say, well, I know everything they're saying. I'm, I'm going about my business. No, you have to keep it in mind. Keep being reminded of it. That's what Paul would say. He said, it don't bother me. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. See, we have to reiterate things repeatedly because we, we are uh, forgetful people. We forgot that God uh, split the Red Sea and brought Israel through, so we made a golden calf shortly thereafter and said, this is who delivered you from Egypt. So we have to be reminded to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it's not grievous. But for you, it is safe. So for me to do a same lesson, even though it might change, vary a little bit, hey, it, it's not grievous to me. And it's safe for us all. 
What else? Beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. That's these greedy dog preachers who not telling us nothing the Lord says. See, we got all kind of warnings in the Bible. Beware of dogs. Go ahead. Beware of evil workers. Uh-huh. Beware of the concision. She's talking about ministers who work in lies. Go ahead. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. Now, the concision is just the Israelites. That's who he's talking about, the Israelites, the circumcision. That's just the Israelites. Because we got more false churches than everybody. Oh, he gave me some scriptures. Woo. <laughs> so he said, for we are the circumcision. That means we Israel. See, what he's telling you is beware of these false preachers, beware of these liars. And he's telling you, mostly a lot of them, we, we got more false preachers in our neighborhoods than anywhere. That's why we, we got more churches, but something not right because it ain't doing us no good. That means we got a lot of false ones. So that's why he said, beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. That's Israel. Then he said, for we are the circumcision. So we some Israelites, just like you say you're a Hebrew Israelite, people think you're crazy sometimes because they're used to some crazy brothers out there talking crazy in the street. But see, hey, you can't lump all nobody together. You can't lump, you know, just because somebody say they're a Christian. That don't mean they worship Mary. Only certain Christians do that. Those that call themselves Christians anyway. So he said, for we are the circumcision which do what? Which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. See, because we know being Israel not going to get you in. So we worship God in the spirit, brothers and sisters. Israel is important to know since that's been a lost fact. But that's being Israel won't get you in or else we would have never got kicked out. Go ahead. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, uh -huh. if any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. See, that's what, you know, you got some Israelites come along, act like they know so much. They come along preaching. All oh, them brothers, see, they don't teach right. That you know they don't deal with fringes or they don't deal with that. Look, they they they, they just talking something to try to make themselves uh, look wiser than somebody else. But hey, they not add nothing to us. So this is what Paul was contending with some Israelites that come along. He said, "Look, hey, they want to talk about Israel. We understand that perfectly." He said, "But we know." Because you got Israelites out here that think only Israel is going to be saved and the Gentiles and no other nation going to make it. They, got, they don't have a chance. That's a lie. So they have a problem with people like us, Israelites like us. So, but Paul said, look, they don't have nothing on me. He said, if, they, if we want to talk about we ain't trusting in the flesh, but I know I'm an Israelite. That's important, but that ain't going to get you into God's kingdom being an Israelite. That's the point Paul making. And then he said, though I might have confidence in the flesh. Go ahead, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, mm -hmm. I more. Uh-huh. Circumcised the eighth day of See, the stock of Israel. Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day, so they ain't got nothing on me. See, it ain't many Israelites around here of age could say that nowadays. I can't say that. I got circumcised on the 25th year. <laughs> but show you that I've been dealing with it long enough. I got some grown sons that were circumcised on the eighth day. I got a son 25 years old. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Got a son 19, 20. He was circumcised on the eighth day. So I've been around long enough to at least make sure that happened. And that's what Paul said. But we know that's, that's good. That's okay. But th that in itself don't get you into the God's kingdom. This is the point Paul making. Go ahead. Of the tribe of Benjamin. He said, not only was I circumcised, they want to talk flesh, talk about knowing about Israel. Like brothers want to throw up fringes like there was a fringe police back in the day. Like they had people checking your friend. Fringe is what's for you. And we know the law is supposed to be in your mind now. That's right. So we know we under the new covenant now. Somebody says, well, you ain't under, we under the new covenant. We under the new covenant since Jesus died. Or else you say you still under the old covenant. You got to pick one. Which one you under? 
If you're under the old covenant, you need to get you some animals and start killing them. But if not, you're dealing with the new covenant, though it won't be brought into full force until Jesus take Israel to the wilderness. But it started already when he died. So he said, look, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any man think it, what? Go ahead. <clears throat> If I man, might also have confidence in the flesh. Mm -hmm. If any man think if he think if that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh more, he said, I more. I more circ go ahead. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. He said, So I hey, I got I got a nice little pedigree, but I know that ain't gonna get me in the kingdom. So he really was downplaying it, but he was pointing it out for some Israelites that want to talk Israel. Go ahead. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, mm -hmm. touching the righteousness which is, which is in the law, blameless. Uh -huh. But what things we gain, uh, but what things we were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. See, but none of that don't mean nothing if you don't have Christ. Go ahead. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but lost. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus uh -huh. my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, uh -huh. that I may win Christ. And he found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. See, you got to have faith in Christ because else you can't make it. Even though that don't do away with the law, Paul said in Romans 3, that we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. But we got to have Christ because we all sinned and broke the law. So it's a balance. But see, you had people here rejecting Christ and say, well, all you got to do is keep the law. No, that ain't going to get you nowhere. That ain't going to get you nowhere. And then you got people on the other hand say, we got Christ, we can throw away the law. That ain't going to get you nowhere. It's six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. Hmm. You need it all. Faith and works. Faith and works. So that's what he was pointing out. But he was dealing with, you know, some Israelites. See, some Israelites had come along, just like we might get out here and preach to people. Then you got some more Israelites come along and try to mess them up. That's what was going on. That's why he started off saying, I got to say the same things to you because that's safe. And beware of dogs. Beware these greedy dogs out for themselves. But go ahead, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. See, this is what we wanted to get to. He said, all this come down that I might know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Because without that, none of it don't mean nothing. We just spinning our wheels. Go ahead. And the fellowship of his suffering. And he suffered big time. Go ahead. Being made comfortable unto his death. Being made conformable unto his death. See, we being made conformable unto Jesus. That, that means we're going to go through the, it too. We're going to go through the ring of some. That's why I said that the lesson, this life is a test that we got to pass. That's what it is. So Jesus is an example. That's why Peter said, arm yourself with the like mind that Jesus had. Because he suffered for us. We're going to do some suffering right now. But it's going to be all right in the end. See, we're doing some suffering now with the loss of our brother. But go ahead. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. But it's all for this point. We're going through this that we may attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is what we're striving for. Not that we won't die. Go ahead. Not as though I had already obtained. He said, I ain't got it yet. Go ahead. Either were already perfect. Uh -huh. But I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Uh -huh. He said, I don't have it, but I'm striving for it. 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't have it. I'm not saved and born again yet. That's what people be saying. He letting you know he knew better than that. Because that means you apprehended. No, you striving to apprehend. Go ahead. But this one thing I do, uh -huh. forgetting those things which are behind uh -huh. and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, I'm, I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm reaching. I'm striving forward. Go ahead. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, he said, I'm pressing on. That means you don't have it if you're pressing, brother and sister. This is a fight to the finish. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, let's see what the prize is. 
It's what we've been reading about all along. Job knew what the prize was. He said, hide me in the grave till your wrath is passed. And wake me up then. You're going to call him on answer. He said, I'm going to be satisfied. He said, I'm waiting on my change. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Let's see if Paul knew that. Skip over to verse 20 and go ahead. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, look, we focus on heavenly things. We got our mind on heaven, spiritual things, and we waiting on the Lord Jesus to come from heaven because that's when it's all going to climax. That's when the dead going to come back. We just need to fight for the prize until then so we can be there. He said, for our conversation in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you going to do? Who shall change our vile body? Oh, he's going to do something magnificent. He's going to change our vile body. See, it don't matter if you on your deathbed or you walking around feeling real healthy. Your body is vile. It's headed toward death. That's right. It's a vile body. It need a change. It don't matter if you a baby because the Bible says we born into sin. And the longer you live, you get shaped in iniquity. Born into sin, shaping in iniquity. So it's vile. So we all need that change that Job understood. He was going to wait till his change come. He going to wait where? In the grave. Then the Lord going to call him, raise him up out the grave. He said, when Jesus come, who going to change our vile body that what? That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Oh, now that's something that should comfort us, shouldn't it? What do we have to worry about if the Lord going to take care of business like this? It don't matter. That's why he said, hey, death is just a pit stop on the way to getting this new body. Go ahead. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Uh-huh. So you're going to be dead for a moment and he's going to wake you up with that new body. See, this is what I'm comforted by. See, this is all that Paul understood. It all hinges on the resurrection. And he told them all that. Then he said, well, for comfort one another with these words, not with no false words. First John, I mean, First Thessalonians 1. First Thessalonians 1, verse 9 and 10. Read it when you get it. For they themselves show of us what manner entering in we had unto you. Uh-huh. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. See, these people, hey, they was, they was letting people know what they was about now. And, 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 they, and they let some people know. And Paul heard it back from the other people. He said, so look, them people had, them people let us know what effect we had on you all. See, if you haven't been affected enough by the word of God to start serving God and get away from this, I like this is an idolatrous season here. They wow. talking about Jesus the reason for the season. Well, Jesus the reason for all seasons. But he didn't give you no Christmas tree to worship hmm. and put in your house. So, and those that know better, stop doing that because it don't have nothing to do with Christ. It's a, it's a pagan God we worship it at this time of year. But Paul had got people away. See, preachers don't talk about getting away from idolatry and flee from idolatry like Paul said. But he had, this is what he was preaching. What did he say? He said, for they themselves show us what manner entering in we had unto you and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. See, this is if you haven't been infected this way, hey, you ain't hearing the word of God. If you think you just hear something and you saved, uh-uh, you got to repent from all sin, including false worship. And in the meantime, what we doing? Verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, uh -huh. whom he raised from the dead, uh -huh. even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. See, and that's what we doing. We waiting. We doing God's will, and we waiting for his son. To come from heaven. And we know we just read when he come from heaven exactly what he's going to do. He's going to change this vile body. He's going to give us a new body. So even those that are sleeping Jesus, they waking up with this new body. Hey, that's something to feel good about. That's something to be comforted by. That's what I expect. 
I'm trying to get to the point where, like Paul said, I can attain to the resurrection of the dead so, hey, I can see Brother Wayne then. 1 John 3. 1 John 3. 1 John, the third chapter. We're almost done. A couple of more. Three and one. Go ahead. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Uh -huh. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because uh -huh. it knew him not. See, you, you, get, you get shunned in the world, really, when you start knowing the Lord. Like somebody was telling me last night, they trying to tell the people at school, that, you know, the kids can't do this. Hey, that's how it is in this world, because the whole world is going contrary to God. So the world, did, but the world didn't know Jesus. That's why they nailed him to a tree. They nailed the Lord to a tree and killed him. Mm. How, did, how does that come about for a man that didn't commit no sin? That means we living in a wicked world. A man didn't commit no sin, and he ended up getting crucified. But God had a good thing. And that's why all things work together for good. That's something to remember, too. All things work together for good to them that love God. So, but that's what he's letting you know. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Once you call the sons of God, he said, that's the love the Father that put on you that you should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Obviously, it didn't. <clears throat> Go ahead, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Uh -huh. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, mm -hmm. but we shall see him as he is. See, it all hinges when Jesus come back. You're not getting it before Jesus come back. You're not going nowhere till Jesus come back. You're going to sleep in the dust, and then when he come back, he's going to wake you up, and he's going to give you the reward then. So that's what he's letting you know. So though we called the sons of God, we still not like God. We got to get that glorious body like God. Jesus said he's going to change it, yes. change our vile body that it may be fashioned like his. He got it already when he came out. That's the purpose of him dying and resurrected. He went from a flesh and blood man that they nailed to a tree to immortal being. It's about becoming an immortal. People don't know that much. We try for more time. That's why we don't let mortal stuff get us down because we striving to be immortal. So it don't matter that much. That's why he said, beloved, now are you the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what you shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, that's Jesus, it always at that time, not before. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like him with a glorious body, like he just told us. And this is the hope we need. This is the hope I have for Brother Wayne. I'm confident Brother Wayne going to be there. Matter of fact, like I said about Brother Will, Brother Will just lost his mother not too long ago, like I said about his mother. See, death, death just keep coming. But like I said about his mother, and I say the same about Brother Wayne, if they don't make it, I'm in trouble. But go ahead, verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. See, but this is what you hoping in. But you're going to do something if you hoping in it, right? You're going to do something. You're not just going to say I'm saved by grace and don't do nothing. No, if you got the real hope, If you got the real faith, you going to act upon it. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as Jesus is pure. That's what he means. He is pure. Even as he is pure. Verse 4. And how you going to purify yourself? The very thing they want to do away with in church. No wonder we all messed up in church. Go ahead. Verse 4. Whoso, whosoever committed sin transgressive also the law. Uh -huh. For sin is the transgression of the law. See, if you want it, you're going to do something. You're going to stop sinning because faith without works is dead. Let's go to John 6. John 6. This is technically the last scripture. John 6.
So like I said, I'm gonna ask the choir to come up and sing, sing the last song again. Uh, after we read this, John 6 and 38. John 6 and 38, go ahead. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Uh -huh. And this is the Father's will, which have sent me, that of all which he have given me, I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. See, Jesus came down from heaven and, and suffered all the atrocities he suffered, even to the point of dying. But he said he, he came down to do the Father's will. And with that in mind, he said, this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing. So again, we should be comforted by the fact it don't matter what happened to us in this life, brothers and sisters. It don't matter what happened to us. If you know the Lord and serving the Lord, the Lord not going to forget about you. He's not going to lose you. Go ahead. And this is the will of him that sent me. Uh -huh. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Uh -huh. And I will raise him up at the last day. See, he said at verse 39, he said, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. Everyone, then 40, everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So that's why he's not going to lose you. So though it looked like we lose someone. We lose a loved one. And like I've been saying in this lesson, we have lost Brother Wayne. He passed away this morning. So, but we know he not lost to the Lord. He lost to us, but he not lost to the Lord. Because the Lord is going to raise him up at the last day. And this is what we comforted by. This is what Paul was talking about when he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Not that somebody not going to die, they're going to die and be right with the Lord in heaven. No, right here, I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him. Uh -huh. And I will raise him up at the last he day. He said, I'm going to raise him up at the last day. This is what I expect wholeheartedly for brother Wayne and I know it's going to happen for all the righteous verse 54 one more whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life uh -huh. and I will raise him up at the last day at the last day this when all the dead come back I'm going to throw one more in here go to John 14 because the title is wherefore comfort one another with these words and the Lord made sure we could be comforted because he knew we was going to need some, need some comfort. John 14, I'm going to read one verse. Verse 18. Because he comforts you through his word, but it's him. That's why I ain't got to make up no words. I don't have to make nothing else up to try to put a nice spin on to make people feel better. The Lord got it all here. 14 and 18. John 14 and 18. Go ahead and read it. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And the Lord come to us by showing us everything we need to know in this word. So I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. <laughs> and like I mentioned just in the lesson, Brother Wayne did pass away this morning, probably around 1030, not long ago. And uh, we thank the Lord for giving us a, a, a mighty warrior to fight this battle. We, gonna, we sad that we, that we losing them, but we know the Lord got a time for everything. So we just thank the Lord. Like, like Job understood when he lost everything he had, he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So this is what we say concerning Brother Wayne, we thank the Lord that he gave him to us. Because you don't, you don't have, uh, you have a great example that he left, providing for his family, working two jobs, taking care of business, and always ready to preach the gospel, go wherever needed to preach the word. 
That's, a, that's, a, that's an example of a real man and a warrior for the Lord. And we, we was planning to, you know, we was planning to keep petitioning the Lord for him. And, uh, but the Lord, he did it before we even got to that, even though some of us already been praying and been fasting all along. He did it before we got to that, and that let me know, hey, it was Brother Wayne time. Right. Only thing happened in the last month, the Lord gave us time, because he could have been gone, like I said last night, a month ago. I didn't seen that happen to brothers. That seems, all of it's devastating, but I think we got a little break here. We kind of got used to something wrong going on because he had a bad motorcycle accident, survived that, then had a, a bad blood clot last week and survived the whole week after that. So everybody involved kind of got used to the idea. So he resting now, and I expect to see him at the day of the resurrection in Jesus' name.
I will Where else can I go? Yes, I trust in no Who else can I turn to? Every believer join in and say I will I will Trust you Trust I will I will Trust you Mention, uh, I wanted to mention something. I think I don't know if Sister Robin did a fly, but we supposed to uh, go to uh, Pine Bluff, Arkansas on December 24th because that's where we're here to spread the word and we got a bunch of people in the area. <laughs> we got a bunch of people in the area and not just in there, really, it's mostly some people in Mississippi. We just kind of meeting in the middle. We got some people, when I went and did the funeral in uh, Greenville, Mississippi, they want to get baptized. So uh, we're going to kind of meet there in Pine Bluff, Arkansas on uh, December 24th. That's a Sabbath. And uh, I don't have the address, but it's going to be at the La Quinta Inn there. We're going to have a, a Sabbath and a baptism there. And because uh, this is what we set up for. This is what Brother Wayne was laboring for. You know, and he did labor. He did more than preach the word, too. He come over here, these, these heaters and air conditions, because that's what he did. He put them in here. And whenever something happened to him, he was over here some nights where I would be here with him, but by himself working, because I couldn't really help him much. So that's how diligent he was. And, uh, but that's what we're here to do, to preach the gospel. So we're going to be there on uh, December 24th, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Also, uh, just a minute. We got a few minutes before we close out. I'm going to just take the mic here and see if anybody else got something they want to say. So this is, this is a, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a rough time for us all. So anybody got something they want to say about Brother Wayne, Brother Nehemiah, Brother Mark is here, Brother Jay, or anybody, period, got something to say. We're going to take a few minutes. I'm going to keep it short. Um, <laughs> I lost my friend. <laughs> I lost my friend. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, 
it's, it's a hard time, but the Lord, like I said, we got, we got what we need to be comforted by. Brother Jay, you got anything? Anybody else got something to say? Somebody raise their hand. Take up the mic for me. Keep going, Dinah. I think. Peace in Jesus' name, everyone. Um, Peace. Back in July, Brother Wayne was an excellent teacher, and back in July, he did a lesson on charity, and charity is something that we all know about, but we don't always focus on. The lesson was very touching. Every word that he spoke, spoke to me. And um, from that day forward, we as a, as a unit have tried to focus more on charity. And I was very moved and grateful by the work that he instilled in us so that we can do and move forward in, in helping others. And, and that's something that I'll always remember about Brother Wayne. Um, he not only did a great lesson that day, he also moved us to do works. So for that, I'm thankful. Somebody else? Yeah, peace to everybody that's here today. Please. Um, the reason I'm here today is because of Brother Walker, and he used to come to my job and help me to understand the word, and I am truly grateful for that. And I will miss him. Peace. 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 And that's what Brother Wayne, he was, he was always evangelizing. He got a number of people in the Word because of him directly. i like to say to the congregation, all my family, I was with my sister Dolly when her husband took his last breath. Darlene needs all our love, as well as Nequa, Camille, Bria, and Wayne and other two children. Wayne will be missed. He was truly a friend and a great husband for my friend Darlene. And he was my husband's friend, Elijah's friend. Everybody here was a friend of Wayne's. He was, like she said, he was a wonderful person and I'm so glad I met him. And we must gather with Darlene, because it's a hard time for her, but she know it was God's will for Wayne to go home and wait on the second resurrection. Thank you. I saw Wayne uh, last Sabbath, me and Mikael had went to the hospital to uh, see him and everything. The brother was <clears throat> fighting then and we found out he had a, had got, we just got there before they had got the CAT scan and everything. So I called out there when I was at work uh, this week and tried to find out something, but I could never get, the nurse was in there with him then. But uh, I've been Wayne, knowing Wayne a long time, not only a, here as a Hebrew brother, but as we was growing up and everything, and uh, he was a co-worker too in the mills. We worked in mills, steel mills together and everything. So brother was a strong brother. So I know how he want us to be strong and keep up the fight because it's a battle and to the end. So we can get a lot of strength for the brother. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
Peace, everybody. Peace. Uh, Brother Wayne, um, I've known him ever since I was, uh, I can remember. I'm one of the most humble uh, brothers I've ever had the honor of meeting. Um, earlier this year, I had the honor of, he pretty much was the first person I ever got to read for. He was a mentor to me. And um, like my father said, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, he will make it into the kingdom and he would truly be missed. Okay, we're gonna take probably a couple more and we're gonna close out. Peace in Jesus' name. I've been knowing Wayne ever since back in the early 70s. Uh, him and my sister now, they was in a singing group together. You know, Wayne was my friend, he was my brother, and I'm gonna miss him. And, um, yeah, I'm going to miss him. Okay, here you go. Okay. This is going to be last. I'm Brother one. Greg. I've uh, been knowing Wayne since 15. Uh, we've been through a lot together. He was like a father and a brother, you know. I love the man so much because of what he have given to me and the changes he have took, we, we went through and, and the stuff that, I mean, the uh, uh, messages that he have shown me since he been in the Word, it, it was even greater. Uh, there would never be a brother like Brother Wayne. And until his, and for his, and his family, as far as his family is concerned, I will, um, um, he want, he would want everybody, we all, his family, he would want everybody to keep going and keep raising up, keep, keep lifting it up. Because one, one thing I learned about Brother Wayne is that I'm gonna miss, what I'm gonna miss about him the most is his laugh. You know, he had a, funny kind of way, you know, that he would throw a joke in his, in whatever he, whatever his message was. So at the same time, he lifted you up with it. And any time you went around, you, you was around Brother Wayne, he cared enough to, you know, to lift you up, you know. And that's one of the things that I'm going to miss about Brother, because I know this, I know I'm going to miss about the Brother, because I know that um, he had my back. All right. All right, we're going to wrap it up now. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I got a text from Darlene from the family. They might be coming here in a little bit, but this is it. No, we got to close. Who is that? I can't see. I need glasses. Vegas. Huh? Brother Vegas. Make it quick because we got to right. close out. Peace everybody real quick, Brother Viz. Um, I wasn't here too long, but uh, I do know that Brother Wayne was one of the smoothest people I know. And uh, I do uh, just want to say I love and appreciate the impact that he had on me and uh, my life and my family and the church family. Peace. Peace. So definitely keep Sister Darlene and, and the children in prayer. And uh, like we saw in the lesson, we know the Lord going to comfort us. Sometimes you don't even see how, but the Lord always does. So with that said, we're going to face Jerusalem and close out. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endures forever.
For his mercy endure forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endure forever. These things we pray in Jesus' name. These things we pray in Jesus' name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The Mighty One of Jacob. The Mighty One of Jacob. The One True God. The One True God. And there is no other. And there is no other. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.